Have you guys been on a cruise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Like, everything is about you on those cruises, right? Well, we'll see what kind of entertains us. We'll kind of see what I want and then go from there, Jesus. Thanks for that encouragement. No. Jesus is saying there's so much on the line here when it comes to church. I say I want to use this as a metaphor for what church is meant to be because we're going to maybe relearn things a little bit. 2006, oh my word. Pete and Michelle said it only gets worse, I guess. So (laughs) thanks for that. Hey, I want to see uh, by a show of hands, how many have been on a cruise before? Have you guys been on a cruise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Like everything is about you on those cruises, right? It is nice. Like you go back to your room and there's towels and, and shapes of animals. You're like, oh, that's nice. They're like entertaining me by like folding towels. Uh, they, they like, while you're sleeping, bring you to a new paradise of an island and you just wake up and you're in this new part of the world you've never experienced before. They bring you nice fruity drinks on trays. Like it is all about you, more about all about your money, but it is all about, it's nice to be served on these places, right? And you're like jabbing your spouse. You're like, if you do this for me at home a little bit, right? They're like, <laughs> It's nice to be served a little bit, and you get those opportunities every once in a while on vacations like that. On one uh, commercial for a cruise uh, that I, I saw, it says this, choose fun, be a better person, be a better parent, be a better friend. And it's saying this amidst, amidst the, the pictures of paradise and beach and splashing and going down water slides. And this is what brings you to be a better person. And I think often that commercial, those words can be the mission statement for certain churches. Hey, hey come, come be a better person. Be a better you. Learn to be a better parent. Learn to be a better friend. And so we get our cruise clothes on and we go seeking a cruise that's going to work for us. And we step into the doors of what we think is going to be a cruise and entertainment and a whole staff of people that are here to serve my every desire. And we, we step onto a ship that doesn't look like a cruise ship. What we realize when we enter the doors of the church is it looks a little bit different. The, the lights aren't as bright. It's a little bit gray and people se- seem to be wearing the same thing and, and, and they're going about doing a mission and they're on, on mission. I say I want to use this as a metaphor for what church is meant to be because we're going to maybe relearn things a little bit. Because as we've grown up in church, we or have come to church at some point in our lives, maybe we've learned some things that really shouldn't have been learned about church. They're not the church that Jesus designed. In fact, if I'm honest, I think some of us would never attend Jesus' church. Jesus, this is, <laughs> this is a long sermon. When is this going to... Jesus, you know we have places to go, right? Does he know we're hungry? Like this has been going on all day. Jesus, we're out in the heat of the sun. Like, can't you do something about this? Turn the air conditioning on. You knew it was going to be a hot morning. Jesus, I'm not sure that's what that passage meant. You're not using scripture like I've come to understand you should interpret that. I think, you know, afterwards I'll show him where my Bible says that. Jesus, do something about these kids. They're just like, they're crying and whining and you're just inviting them up to you while you're teaching? Like, Jesus, get a handle on this. I'm not, I'm not sure we would attend the church that Jesus is leading. We all have our opinions. And I know I can say those things because I've had those opinions uh, about church and the way I would want it as well and what makes me comfortable, right? Like I've wanted to walk into church like it was a cruise ship to suit my needs and suit my desires and and to whoosh my kids off to some form of entertainment while I can enjoy myself as well. It's hard to erase the whiteboards of our opinions. So I want to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 16 that I think gets us at an understanding of church and what Jesus meant by that word itself. Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to start at verse 13. 
says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He's referring to himself. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overcome it. Let's start with this word church that Jesus uses here really mentioned for the first time in scripture, this word church, and it, it shows up in different Greek terms, but the translators understand this as Jesus talking about the church here. What is church? The first point I have, the church is with a blank. How do you fill out that blank? What word or words do you put in that blank? Because how you finish that sentence is important. What ship do you think you're walking onto? When you go to church, the church is what? Well, looking at it a little literal with what Jesus is actually saying here in the Greek and the words he's using, ekklesia, it's, it's, if we took a little, little translation, it simply is the called out. It's the called out. It's this assembly. It's almost as a military processional. Here are the called out ones, the ones that I've I've chosen uh, among everybody else that has stepped up to be part of this assembly. And so here's just a general way to end it this morning. The church is people who belong to Jesus. The church is people who belong to Jesus. Jesus says, hey, I'm forming this church based on what is just being said in this passage that we'll get to in a second. These that have stepped out, this assembly, and Jesus is the commander. And so it is the people who belong to Jesus. I came across a bit more of a specific definition of church. It's a spiritual family growing in surrendered obedience to all the teachings of Jesus Christ who gather together regularly under the biblically recognized leadership for the purpose of fulfilling the great commission, which is making disciples with a great commandment heart, loving God and loving others. See, Jesus is the head of the church. I told you, he's the commander. He's the one that has called us out to assemble. And as the head, we are the feet and hands of Jesus. And this is not just a neat illustration that is played out in kids' programs with a flannel graph. This is real life. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, not just on a Sunday morning as we gather. That's not what church is. It's not just a building where we assemble. The church is you and I going out as the hands and feet tomorrow and showing people Jesus. It's going out on Tuesday. It's going to the PTO meeting. It's going to work. It's going to school and being Jesus to those people's hands and feet. This is a real life thing that we are part of. And Jesus is our commander and king. Ephesians 1, verse 23 says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So as the church, we represent the fullness of Jesus to the world around us. That's beautiful. That's a, that's a mission. We're not just here for entertainment. We're here to get it done. Now, in this passage we just read, Jesus said this thing about the rock. He said, uh, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. What is this rock that is talked about in this passage? And historically, this has been a minefield of understanding. The Roman Catholic Church sees this as, 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 as Peter becoming the first pope. And on the first pope, there'll be papal su- succession, and what the pope says becomes equal to Scripture. I don't see that in this passage. So some, to kind of combat that, say, well, it's not, it's not the Pope necessarily or Peter that becomes the foundation of the church. It's, it's what he said in this moment, right? That he said that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's on that admission. It's on that 
faith that he gives in that moment that their church is built on. I can see it as, as both of these things combined, actually. There seems to be a play on words. And if your Bible's like my Bible, it makes a mention that when Jesus says Peter, it has like a little footnote that says Peter means rock. And so there seems to be a clear word play that Jesus is using about this. In this moment about who Peter shows to be. He's showing that he has faith and understanding of who Jesus is. This is not the same Peter that later will deny knowing Jesus three times and having doubts. This is a Peter of faithfulness, a Peter that, that is affirming who Jesus really is. It's why we ask people that join the church this, to repeat this same statement, because we understand this affirmation that people, Peter gives in this moment is what the church is unified over. There's a lot of other things. We could be unified over, but there's nothing more important than who Jesus is. And so we ask these same things that Peter affirmed in this moment, because that is what the church is built on. This affirmation of faithfulness to who Jesus is, and it's a powerful moment. It's a powerful moment where the disciples understand maybe what's before them. I don't think they fully understand, but it's a moment we're supposed to read and, and, and not take away and say, oh, I, I see church, I understand that. We'll, we'll get some coloring pages out and do some coloring pages. We'll, we'll see what kind of entertains us. We'll kind of see what I want and then go from there, Jesus. Thanks for that encouragement. No. Jesus is saying there's so much on the line here when it comes to church. It's not about potlucks and entertainment. Hell is at stake. And why has this been so ingrained in us that church is about us? I think it starts often at a young age. If you've done this uh, activity before, maybe you could do it with me, right? <laughs> here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open up the door. See all the people. Here's what's wrong about it. This is not a church. The, the building it's not the church. The, what Jesus' words here, he's not referencing a building. I'm going to build a building on that faith. And that building will never be overcome. That this is not the church. This is the church. The people, the assembly are the church. And so just in our vernacular, when we're talking about, hey, what are you doing this Memorial Day weekend? Well, I'm going to go, you know, I'll start with church. I'll go to church. That's not how it's ever meant to be used. I'll, I'll be the church. I'll be the church all weekend. It's not just an 845 time frame to show up and go to church. I am the church. And so it's just been so ingrained in us. And it's hard to, to, to get over this, to, to learn something new. It's one way that Satan loves to work is just to, to minimize the church to, well, a gathering once a week that we check in and check out of. I'll, I'll go to church and then be done with it. And I can think about it on Sunday morning when I need to be there. And then the rest of the week, I can forget about it. That's never how it's supposed to be. But Satan loves to work in that way to minimize the impact and effectiveness of the church. Maybe a better song that maybe some of you learned. And you guys were participating with me that first one. I really need you to participate this time because there's a little singing involved. And I don't sing, like last week it should have been Rob singing this song because he's the one that sings, not me. And so I need you to be louder than my singing. And if you don't know it, just pretend you do, but just be loud so people can't hear me. Okay, here we go. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never soar over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. You guys got it. Good job. This section, good job, that section. That is a much better picture of the church. And we think about Memorial Day being tomorrow. That is a much better picture of the church than a cruise ship. There's a mission. There's a war to be fought. There's signing up. There's sacrifice. Think of it as an army. I don't know if Jesus' first disciples would have thought about that when they first heard this. I mean, there had to be some questioning. Jesus, we're just, 
we're just the rejects of other rabbis and you chose us and we showed up and here we are. And like, you're talking about army, we're, we're assembling for something. I'm not sure, Jesus, you sure you have the right guys. We often think of our, our potential or where we are and Jesus sees something completely different in them. Let's continue on in this passage. Matthew 16, we'll pick up there in verse 19 where we left off. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I wish we had time for that. We don't this morning. But then he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Here's what we realize. The church must be, has to be, will be the cares about what God cares about. The church must care about what God cares about. That's what we are as a church. We wouldn't be a church if we didn't care about what God cared about. We need to continually remember this. I mean, here the accusation against Peter is that he just has human concerns. And I think we give Peter a bad rap. He was probably speaking on the behalf of the other disciples. Maybe they were judge, nudging him and like, Peter, go tell Jesus, you can't do this. Like, what, what is going on? And Peter brings Jesus to the side to say, Jesus is not, and Jesus calls him out and says, no, no, you only have human concerns. What, what would the church be like if it was just filled with human concerns, right? Man, the temperature in here, do they, do they not pay the bills? Like, it is warm in here right now. Ah, this music, I'm not sure. The volume, man, the volume. Man, they better have a stellar kids program if I'm going to show up there. Man, that youth group, I mean, that game up there was a little cool, but they better be doing the right things back in youth group. We have a lot of concerns when it comes to the church, and I think rightly we should have concerns. We want the church to be doing right things, but we need to prioritize and understand we need to care what God cares about above all else, above our comfort above our human concerns. The first satanic force to oppose the church is selfishness. You you see that in Peter's answer, right? Jesus, you can't do this. We want you. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, you can't suffer. What are you talking about? This is not the way it's supposed to be. And 2,000 years later, one satanic force that's still against the church is selfishness. Man, I'll go to that church if, if it's right for me, if it suits my needs, if they dress correctly, if, if their parking lot's big enough. For, I know our parking lot's not big enough, okay? We're trying. <laughs> A passage you may remember once I start reading it. This may be a passage you've not seen how it's connected to the church before, but it's clear, church and glory. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is a work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. See, this is the big difference that we've been talking about in this series when it comes to love. We've talked about loving our families. We've talked about loving our neighbors. We've talked about loving the disenfranchised, loving the church this week. But we've been talking about the love that glorifies. And that's the difference in all the love that we see outside of the church and this other love that we get in the church and the love that we have from God and the love that we as Christians extend to others. It's a love that glorifies. Because all those other loves in the world, they just end on that person, right? We, We feel love, we receive things, we feel that warmth because that love is about us. And it ends there. But the love we have for the church, the love we have for one another in the church is a love that glorifies, which means that it's never meant to end with them. It's meant to radiate back to God, to glorify him. It's, it's saying something about his nature 
and his presence. That's what we've talked about the first week of this series. If you missed that, that God's glory is part of his nature and his presence. And when we love each other well in the church, it says something about God's nature and presence. And so God wants to show up to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. You think you know what you want in the church, but God is waiting to show up even bigger than that. Not for you, not for the sake of the church to look good like, like Norman Christian churches, us in our little bubble here. It gives God glory. It goes beyond us into his kingdom to give God glory through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Peter O'Brien says the church is the masterpiece of God's grace. The very existence brings glory to God. Our mission statement here at Norwin Christian Church, and even just saying that in the mission statement, this is like uh, going back to the military term, right? Like this is a mission, is to reach out and teach all to follow Jesus. To reach out and teach all to follow Jesus. Because we know there's a mission before us for the world to know about Jesus and the love that he has for them. And so we do this, we come together to get pumped up in here, to get educated, to get motivated, to go out and to win the world. And so that when those satanic forces press up against us, we don't just hold the line. We drop our shoulder and push back because the kingdom needs to be advanced in our community. Kingdom needs to be advanced in our world so people know who Jesus is because they're dying. They're dying without him. Even when it costs us something. I want to go back to this passage, picking up where we left off, chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Forever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for, the soul, for their soul? If I had to sum up this part in one word, it would be the word sacrifice. And here's my last point for this morning. The church is always marked by people making sacrifices. The church is always marked by people making sacrifices. It was started by God sending his son to be a sacrifice. Jesus giving his blood and body as a sacrifice and calling the assembled together to make sacrifices. Another passage, Romans 12, one through two, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what, renewing your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good, pleasing and perfect will. I don't know a better picture of this than Memorial Day, where people signed up not knowing exactly what would be asked of them, but willing to give their very lives, and many of them did. There's another illustration, uh, this time from Lord of the Rings, and I, in my personal theology, believe every sermon's better with a Lord of the Rings analogy. (laughs) The best scene, I think, in the books and the movie come from the ride of the Rohirrim. It's in the last bit and in the last big battle of the last movie. And the Rohirrim are those that are on the horses. They've been trained on horses. This is what their people do. And they're a little late to the battle because they've been assembling. And King Theoden is gathering them together. They're on the edge of battle. Arise. Arise, men of Theoden. Fell deeds awake, fire and slaughter. Spears will be shaken. Shields will be splintered. A sword day, a red day, ere the sun rises. Ride now. Ride now. Ride to Gondor. And then in the book, which the movie leaves out, it says, and the darkness fell as they went into battle singing. I think because they found their purpose in life. Everything they had been doing in their lives up to that moment was happening. It was finally time to get into the game. 
It's a lot, put, a lot closer to the picture of a church than a cruise ship. It's a march to bring glory to God. You and I, as, as we're part of the church and we've, we've signed up, we said the words that Peter said, that, that we understand him to be the Christ, the son of the living God, our Lord and Savior. And we march forth. Not to, to shake real spears or to have our shields splintered with real weapons of this world, but you better believe we are in a war. And we live on a mission as people that follow Christ. As the band comes up, I want to read something. And, and these are the moments in life that become surreal when uh, you're like, this is a Holy Spirit moment. And one of the members here at the church uh, emailed me this just last night. And she said, hey, I was going through my mom's stuff and I came across a 25-year history of the church. And some reflections on the church after 25 years. I, maybe you can use this. And I was like, oh, I'm using it tomorrow. She said, okay, all right, I got, I got her permission. <clears throat> So reflections of the last 25 years. The seed was planted in early 1961 when three families met to discuss the need for a new work to be started in the Irwin area. These early pioneers were Ed and Alma Chobie, uh, Frank and Pat Kvasic, and Dick and Lorraine Phillips. The sprout burst into existence as of April 9th, 1961. Manly Pierce preached to a, to a congregation of 18 at Hartford Heights Fire Hall. There were eight additions that day. The early years were not without problems, of which memories are made. Each week, the chairs, hymnals, and communion utensils arrived with the congregation. Pat and Frank Kvasic brought the bulletins, which they typed on a bar borrowed typewriter and mimeograph. I have no idea what that is. You laugh, but you're the ones that are old enough to remember. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was, that was, okay. Before services could begin at 8.30, the leftovers from the firemen's Saturday night revelries had to be removed and chairs and partitions set up. On rainy days or in the summer, seating was always subject to change as rain or melting tar dripped through the roof. But more importantly, showers of blessings fell inside from the lips of men. How beautiful is that? She goes on to talk about building projects, needing a building. They started meeting in the, the church, that, uh, the building that's right across, the house that's right across from us currently. And then they spotted this land. It said, with God's help and much dedication on the part of 35 active attenders, the church building was erected and the church itself began to grow, our current fellowship hall in our downstairs youth area. In June 1966, Pat Kvasic directed the first vacation Bible school in this building with 72 children attending. On Easter Sunday, 1967, there was a record 92 in worship, and we won the Keystone Bible School contest by increasing our average Sunday school attendance from 35 to 65. Our total annual income, so it was 1967 that year, was $9,581.61. Continuing on, it says our faith pr promise, which was a uh, beyond your regular tithes and offerings, you're going to dedicate a mountain to, to go specifically to world missions. October 1982, our goal was $5,000. We received $13,150 in pledges. Soon we had outgrown our current facilities, even with the addition of three-room uh, three mobile home. It became evident that there was need of an educational wing, this back hallway. Our great, the, on the great day, July 26, 1985, we brought in $15,600 towards that goal. Since 1961, Norwood Christian Church has worked, prayed, and grown together. We have rejoiced with the angels, with 193 who have been buried with their Lord in Christian baptism since the first. There have many changes in a quarter of a century, changes in appearance, attitudes, facilities, and philosophies, but our God has not changed, and neither has the commission left us. And so our goal remains constant to go to preach, to baptize, and to continue to teach just as a city on a hill cannot be hidden, so this church on a hill must not hide its light and must not rest till everyone in the area knows and loves our God as we do. Amen. How beautiful that is. Amen. 
And I know there's so many reasons to be proud of this church after 61 years of being existence. You've lived out the call, Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let, all do good to, uh, let us do good to all people, especially that, those that belong to the family of God. So many of you live that out day in and day out. You are good to one another. You're at the hospital before I can get there. You're meeting needs before anybody calls. You are doing good to the people of the Lord. Others of you have been shot on the battlefield and you are wounded. And so we'll surround you. You have church hurt or you have a deep set of wounds from childhood or you have doubts. And we're going to gather around you to bring you to the hospital so you can heal and get back in battle. But some of you have never signed up. You weren't sure what you're stepping out into. And you were wearing your flowery shirt thinking maybe this is a cruise ship and it's not. And we're asking you to sign up and get on board with what looks to be a lot more like a battleship than a cruise ship. Because we have a lot of others to tell about Jesus, some hard conversations, some sins to confess, some shortfalls to get past, and a mission to be a part of. Dear Lord, we thank you for this mission. It's a mission that brings us back into the battle after we're hurt, a mission that shows all of our weakness, but when we're weak, you are strong. And so God, show up in our lives. Let the Holy Spirit be part of our lives as we live out this truth to all those around us. Because like this was, was said 40 years ago about this church, we're, we're a church on a hill and we will not stop until everybody comes to know the love that you have for them. We thank you. In your son's name we pray, amen. Why don't you stand with us? If you have anything you need, you can go over to the prayer cove during this song, but sing with us this morning.